Do you know what's worse than being on call when an outage happens? Hello? Being on call when an outage happens on a Friday. Deploying on Fridays has been one of the most common pain points that we discuss in the industry, both as a meme, but also as a real problem that we have. Because when something goes down on Friday, it sucks because you have a limited window on the day that's supposed to be chill to fix it. And you might have to work into the weekend if you don't fix it in time. Hello, Peter. So I want to talk today a bit about these crazy outages that we've been seeing more and more of everywhere from GitHub to Cloudflare and what it looks like to build a culture that prevents these types of outages. We're also going to break down the types of changes that can and can't cause an outage and how we should plan around them accordingly. Because I think good culture around outages and protection of your code is a really important thing that we don't talk about enough. Before we go into how to prevent these outages, I want to break down the types of changes that can cause outages into two buckets. Those are easy to roll back and hard to roll back. I'll use upload thing as an example. Whenever we deploy something for upload thing on the front end or on our infrastructure, that all tends to go through Vercel. With Vercel, if there's an outage, it's one click to roll back. I could even show you guys really quick. So here are some of the things we're working on. You can see we're working on Terraform and multi-region support, all really exciting stuff. But I could also change this to production environments. And here are the production environments for upload thing. If this banner change was bad and caused an outage, I could click here, Promote to production, instant rollback, redeploy. I have a lot of options here to immediately make this the production branch again, in case the current one has a problem. We also have Planet Scale, which has their 30 minute window where if you make a database change and something goes wrong, you have 30 minutes to roll back. It all of the data that's been written in that time will be both in the new table and the old one you're rolling back to. It makes it really, really easy for us to do the right thing based on the problem that we have and when we know the last good state was. It would be way more stressful building what we're building and running a company like Upload Thing if we didn't have the ability to roll things back. And I know that because we don't have the ability to roll everything back because Upload Thing also has open source packages. And these open source packages get released on NPM. And you can't really roll things back on NPM. It's actually notoriously bad to the point where certain packages are in a bad state when you default NPM install them. Because when you NPM install them, if someone accidentally pushed a newer version that wasn't meant to be out yet, the only way to trump that is another newer version on top. So if we did our 6.0.1 release and it turned out it was broken, we can't take down 601. We have to push up 602. And God forbid 600 was bad. We have to either rush a fix to 601 or we have to redeploy something from version 5 that was safe as an override to version six as 601. There is no scenario where a bad release through something like NPM doesn't suck immensely, like immensely badly. And this is what I fear now and what I see a lot of other companies dealing with is mechanisms for contribution and deployment that are hard to roll back. And this is why we probably won't do a major release for an upload thing package on a Friday because we can't roll that back trivially. And it's important to think about these things more realistically where certain pieces can be rolled back and we can be a little more liberal with how we make changes to them. And then the parts that we can't roll back, we need to treat very, very differently. The other important piece here is how many of these types of things you have and are there things that could be rolled back easily that can't be due to technical decisions that were made previously? How hard is it to roll things back and can it be easier? Something that I talk a lot about and haven't as much recently is my idea of safety nets versus guardrails. I feel like too many developers are focused on building guardrails. And then when things do go wrong, they don't have a method to recover. Guardrails are things like unit tests or code review, where they're helpful ways to prevent certain types of mistakes before they go out, but they don't help you once the mistake happens. And if you've invested most of your company's effort into building more guardrails to prevent mistakes, you don't have any more likelihood of getting out of a mistake once it's happened. You've just slightly increased the likelihood you won't have one. And as we talked about in another video I recorded today, bugs happen at a rate that's pretty absurd even. From the studies we were reading, up to 70 bugs occur per thousand lines of code. And over 15 of those bugs make it to users after code review, after tests, after all those other things. 15 bugs per thousand lines of code make it into the code that ships. It doesn't matter how good your tests are, doesn't matter how effective QA is, you're going to ship bugs. And that means if you ship on Friday, you're going to have outages on Fridays. The only way that's justifiable and the only way you can keep your engineers sane when they're doing this is by building really good safety nets having an easy, trivial way to roll things back when they go wrong, having good error reporting from tools like Sentry or Axiom or Highlight that will give you the insights you need to debug the issue when it happens as quickly as possible. These types of tools are so, so important 
if you're going to be shipping, especially if you're going to be shipping fast, because bugs are going to happen. And as much as we love to talk about solutions to prevent bugs, we need to talk more about the solutions to repair them when they happen and how effectively you can get a fix out. This is why I do things like prioritize our build pipe being shorter than five minutes. If we need to ship a last minute fix, it shouldn't take half an hour for all the builds to kick off before the fix gets deployed. We should be able to do that in minutes, ideally in seconds if we can do a rollback instead. Focusing on these safety nets is so important. So much so that I heavily push all the engineers watching this, get involved in your on-call process as aggressively as you can. One of the best things you can do, especially as a new engineer on a team, is be deeply involved in on-call. Even if you're not the one fixing the bugs, you're just there to be there when one happens as a junior dev that's not as familiar with the code base or the process. Seeing what's fragile, where the bugs happen, and what the process for fixing them is like is one of the most valuable things you can learn when you join a team. Because it doesn't just show you how code works when it's working, it shows you how process works when code fails. And that's so much of why we're paid what we're paid, and that's so much of the importance we bring to the software that we contribute to. How do we fix things when they fail? And if you're not already on call, why? If you can be, I highly, highly recommend it because there's no better way to see what isn't isn't working at your company. And then you'll be in a position to propose changes to make it easier to identify these issues. I know I've seen some chaotic stuff where bugs existed in the code base for months, if not years, and the process to get rid of them involved a ton of code review from people who weren't really responsive. And I ended up pushing process at Twitch to allow us to override those types of things if we need to ship fixes really quickly, because this the stuff's important. And you only know how important it is when you're in the trenches fixing the problems once they hit production. And I find that people tend to panic once the bug hits rather than accept it. Something I used to push really hard at Ping was trying to set up every engineer to have a production outage in their first week or two after joining the team. So you get it out of your system so you're not worrying constantly about when you're going to cause an outage or every line of code you write, every change you deploy causing a problem. Because problems are going to happen. You just need to get it out of your system and familiarize yourself with the process to fixing these bugs when they do happen. And that's really the point I want to beat home with this video. Deploying on Fridays is bad, but having no process for when a bug happens is worse. Some issues and some things you ship aren't going to have a good process, like NPM. If you ship a bad package, that sucks. And you should treat that differently from if you ship a bad version of your app or you ship a bad change to your backend. The types of bugs that can be quickly repaired and can be redeployed and can be encapsulated in a way that you and your team own absolutely should be. Even if the service is relatively stable, the amount of stress relief that you have when you know you can fix things that quickly, especially once you have that outage, is so important. And good internal culture and documentation around these things is the only way you're going to survive a bad Friday deployment. I I wish we talked about these things more. And this is why I think building safety nets for your team is so, so important. If you want to hear more about my takes on these things, I'll pin a video in the corner all about how I think about testing. If you've already seen that or you're not interested, YouTube thinks you like the one below it. Appreciate y'all a ton as always. Thank you so much. Peace nerds.